of sex-specific differences in myocardial injury incidents after COVID-19 mRNA-1273 booster vaccination. Now, the interesting thing about this study is instead of looking at people who showed up in a medical setting complaining of issues that then turned out to be myocarditis or pericarditis, what they did is they simply censused the blood of people who took a booster for troponins, which are a marker of cellular damage in the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, this is a test in some sense of what we've talked about previously on the podcast, which is if you're seeing all of these cases of myocarditis, how many cases are you not seeing because they didn't reach a point where the person sought medical help for them, right? Mm -hmm. They had some pain, they misunderstood what it was, they never showed up in a doctor's office, which is still potentially life reducing. Right? Myocarditis is a serious condition, and uh, it is profoundly associated with shortened lifespan. So it is good to know how many of these subclinical cases there are. Mm -hmm. And in this study, as reported by, do you want to read what you got there? Yeah, this is just from the abstract. Among 777 participants, median age 37, 69.5% women. That's just that's, I, right. that's, that's a right. sample. Uh, for, right, sorry. Uh, 40 participants had elevated HSCT and T concentration on day three, and whew, mRNA 1273 vaccine associated myocardial injury was adjudicated in 22 participants. And one of the interesting things that come out of this is not just the remarkably high rate of, uh, of heart injury uh, associated with the boosters, uh, it was about one in 35, um, but that as I say here in the abstract, 20 cases occurred in women, 3.7%, and two in men, 0.8%. Uh, and these are um, you know, mild and only temporary. So they're they are referring to these as transient, which is why presumably they haven't been caught um, previously, uh, but that it's a, it's a much higher, higher rate in women uh, than in men. Uh, which is, of course, the opposite direction of the less transient injury, transient injury um, that we've been hearing about more. And, you know, of course, what is part of what is raised here is uh, what does it mean that it is transient? Right. That the indicator is transient is true, but that doesn't mean that there aren't lasting effects. Right. And in fact, as I have pointed out again and again, the heart is a very special tissue in which damage is it produces a scar rather than a proper repair. Even in tissues where you have a proper repair, there's a limit in almost all tissues. There are a couple of exceptions, but in almost all tissues, there's a limit to how much repair you can do in a lifetime. So even if you have a repair in which a loss of function is not detectable, what these things do is they advance the aging of those tissues so that you can, you know, you get a certain number of those repairs in life. And uh, if you keep breaking the same thing, you exhaust them early. Right. Or, you know, in my case, I lost teeth because an orthodontist moved my teeth too rapidly and he burned up my lifetime capacity for repair in jaw tissue. And so anyway, it, your jaw tissue has a higher capacity for repair than your heart does. Vastly, vastly higher. And it has a built in system for dealing with minor motions of teeth because your skull shape changes over a lifetime. But put that aside, the heart is one of uh, a small number of tissues that has essentially no capacity for proper repair. That is to say, cells do not get replaced in kind. What they get replaced with is scar tissue that allows the heart to continue to function, but you don't regain the capacity of the fully functional heart that you damaged. So the expectation is these troponins are a useful marker. You ever wonder how if you have something that seems to be a heart attack and uh, you recover a within a couple of days, they can test you and see whether you did have a heart attack. It's markers like this that they use. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the fact that these markers show up suggests damage to the heart. The idea that the markers are transient, as you point out, doesn't mean that the damage is transient. And all of it is pretty scary because myocarditis is demonstrated to be a life-shortening condition. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, one does have the sense that the paper was written to emphasize the transientness. You know, oh, here's an interesting finding, but maybe it... Uh, uh you know, I don't. I I didn't actually get that. I've uh, I've skimmed the paper, and I did not get the sense that they were um, trying to emphasize the transientness, but trying to be very careful about uh, saying the the you know, as you say, the markers that we used were transient. Right. But in any case, the idea that if you test people who got um, this shot without them having to show up 
reporting a complaint and you find a one in 35 rate, and then, you know, it's not a huge sample size, but nonetheless, one in 35 is a huge number of people to have a heart injury from a vaccine that was given where almost all of the people it was given to would have recovered from COVID on its own, didn't need a shot to protect them. And what's more, the shot didn't protect them. The shot did not prevent transmission or contraction. And it even now seems to make contraction of the disease more likely if you get right. enough of these things. So the I'm, whole thing is is an incredible debacle. It raises questions for me, of course, about what uh, what this research would look like in people um, after getting their their first vex the, the first vaccine, because this is, of course, in people already vaccinated, hospital workers already vaccinated going in for their boosters. Uh, so, you know, is is this a higher rate? Than we would see after a first or second vaccine. My guess is yes, um, that there there is cumulative damage associated, uh, that these that these markers um, may persist for longer um, or come on uh, in more people the more the more these shots people get. But I don't I haven't seen that research, so I don't know. Well, it depends radically. Sorry, and I, and, oh, sh sorry, I should say I haven't seen that research because I don't think it's been done. It depends radically on the mechanism of action of the damage. And this is, we're going to get a little deeper into this in the next little section. But, you know, depending, uh, Mark Girardot, I think is his last name, advanced what I think is a high quality theory, Mark, or high quality hypothesis. Mark, um, believes it is the reason for the damage. I believe it is a contributor. But his point was, he calls it bolus theory. And the idea mm -hmm. is that a bolus dose that gets into your bloodstream by virtue of the needle not having been aspirated and occasionally hitting a vein results in a large amount of this uh, mRNA coated in lipid nanoparticle flooding tissues of the body. Mm -hmm. And when a big dose of it hits the heart, you get the equivalent of an internal burn right? Because those cells are taken up. They're then killed by the immune system. This is the thing uh, I've been arguing that when this thing properly transfects cells it wasn't supposed to transfect. Those cells get destroyed by the immune system. And if that's in your heart, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. That does not require it to be a bolus dose. That can be any dose. Any cell that gets transfected in your heart will then be attacked by your immune system. But um, but in any case, if it's the bolus dose issue, so that each time you get one of these shots and the needle is not aspirated, you're running the risk of a bolus dose, then the basic point is you're, you, it's a lottery each time. And so mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily expect a big difference between the first shot, the second shot, the third shot. It's just that each time, the chances yeah. that the needle lands in a vein would predispose you to an injury. And the point is, oh, God, that's really scary. If it's 1 in 35 each time, then three yeah. shots in, you're 3 in 35. So it's a distinction between um, <clears throat> cumulative versus everyone is an independent uh, crapshoot, um, ra rather like the risk um, from, say, um, some of the... Um, radioactive particles uh, that have that may be uh, in fish from Fukushima. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so in any case, the, the large background rate of a, this is not a minor issue, and you would have damage right. even if the thing worked correctly, but the damage would be in a tissue where you could afford it if the thing worked according to its design. The point at which it escapes your your deltoid and is circulating in the body, it's a crapshoot in that regard too. And the fact is, again, we're dealing with one in 35, which is an unacceptably large rate. But now imagine that, you know, they're not looking at markers for damage to your kidneys. One in 35 detectable heart damage for a single, the third dose of a particular shot. If that number is either cumulative or in some other way compounding, then we need to understand what that pattern is. Further, if we're not checking for markers to damage to other tissues, as you point out in the Fukushima fish example, you don't find what you're not looking for. The, so now we have to be uh, very precise here. A good vaccine, let's say a, um, a attenuated virus-based vaccine, will cause some damage to tissues because the immune system will target the cells that have been infected by this attenuated virus. However, it will not be the body-wide crapshoot that the mRNA vaccines are 
because whatever virus was attenuated had a particular ecology where it was focused on invading cells that were useful to it and not focused on any cell it encounters. So there will be a limit to the amount of damage, and that was simply absent from the design of the mRNA shots. There is no targeting whatsoever. The targeting was entirely about where it was injected, and the fact that we knew that it escaped from the deltoid means the body is all open to being transfected with this stuff. And so therefore, what can we say? Unlike a normal vaccine, there will be damage across many tissues. That damage could be widely distributed, and in many tissues that will be unimportant, right? You'll not be able to measure a difference. Doesn't mean no damage. We shouldn't think of it as no damage, but we should say undetectable in any concentrated way. In as, the... as even... Um compelling traditional uh, vaccines would cause, which is net beneficial because... Um... Well, let's put it this way. If you take an attenuated virus vaccine, it has almost no reason to attack a cell in your heart because the heart is not a good place from which to spread to other people. So the heart would be isolated from that damage by virtue of the evolutionary ecology of the virus that was attenuated. Because no such thing exists with the mRNA platform, what we have to say is, look, this is going to transfect some heart cells. It's going to result in the immune system attacking those heart cells. There are people for whom that's just simply not a risk worth taking. It's, and lots of them. It, an mRNA vaccine, in quotes, is inherently indiscriminate uh, because you've, you've abandoned the selective pressure of the original organism, mm -hmm. virus. Uh, and of course, with SARS-CoV-2, we have that two times because you've already abandoned the original selective pressure of the original virus by creating a Frankenvirus in a lab based on an original virus. So you've got some selective environment that still uh, the public health authorities and the researchers aren't being honest about with regard to how this thing was created in the first place. And then you've got a vaccine uh, that is um, that is only providing instructions to make the spike protein. Uh, and that will go anywhere as opposed to an attenuated virus vaccine, uh, which is still driven by it's, you know, unconscious, all of this, but it's evolutionary, it's original evolutionary pressure to get to tissues where it can then spread to other in individuals, potential hosts. Yep. Uh, so for, for two big reasons, we've got these, uh, these mRNA so-called vaccines uh, that are more likely to do damage than uh, a traditional attenuated virus vaccine. Yes, and I would point out that the logic of the attenuated virus vaccine is somewhat sketchier with the adenovector DNA-based COVID vaccine, but it's a lot closer because they did borrow an existing virus, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an attenuated virus. Somewhat sketchier than what? Um, the logic that says an attenuated virus is limited by the ancestral ecology of the virus that was attenuated. This is, you know, the, the DNA-based vaccine, they borrowed a wholly different virus, right? It's not SARS-CoV-2. Right. Um, so it is effectively an attenuated virus, but because there's new technology here, it is it less... Ha it hasn't been fully stripped of its evolutionary background. Right. And so the evolutionary yes. background will have it targeted on whatever cells that yes. ancestral virus that they've borrowed. No, I don't know what, you know, what the evolutionary ecology of that... Uh, of the adenovirus. I, I don't yeah. know. Um, but but, but, but let's it, just but say... But it existed in nature and it did something. And, and we and know... Those, and that something wasn't spreading from host to host by targeting heart cells. Right, exactly. Yes. The, 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 the point is a virus has an interest in leaving you intact in tissues where it is not getting an advantage by replicating because uh, you spread it more if you're still up on your feet, yeah. right? It's not like a, a mosquito-borne uh, pathogen where knocking you flat on your back actually serves the, the pathogen. The virus wants you on your feet enough to spread it. And yeah. so that will apply to the adenovirus that the DNA uh, vaccines are based on. It does not apply to the pseudovirus that is effectively what the mRNA vaccines are based on. Okay, so we've got some huge rate. If we look only at the heart, we've got a huge rate of subclinical injuries from a particular inoculation of a shot that people got many inoculations of, and we don't yet know the story of how those inoculations compound. Yep. Um, so that is a frightening 
and important picture. Uh, as John Campbell says, if regulators don't take notice of this, what the hell is going on, right? How can they miss this? 